And I'm Tim Taylor. I'm with the, I'm the executive director of the Sacramento Clean Cities Coalition, and uh, we'd like to thank everyone who's joining us today. Our presentation today is is by U.S. Gain on their polyfuels uh, fueling strategy and how to future-proof infrastructure you may have today. And be sure that you don't make mistakes as you introduce infrastructure to support yourselves today and in the future. U.S. Gain is one of the largest natural gas fueling uh, uh, companies in the United States and one of the largest suppliers of renewable natural gas to the state of California. Um, and uh, today our speakers will be John Somerset, who's the uh, Director of Product Management with U.S. Gain, and Martin Mills, who's the Business Development Manager at U.S. Gain. As Edgar mentioned, we will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to the folks from U.S. Gain. John and Martin, uh, you're on. Thank you, Tim, for the introduction. Um, I did want to note just quickly on the slide that you introduced earlier, we do support ethanol and biodiesel as well, so circle every one of those fuels for us as a polyfueling provider. Um, let me share my screen here. So thank you for your time today. I wanted to talk today about future-proofing infrastructure investments and doing that through polyfueling. I appreciate the time to talk to you today on behalf of U.S. Gain and polyfueling. To explain the term a little bit more, it's a fueling strategy that is comprised of multiple alternative fuels. It's going to enable you to tailor your fuel selection and meet the diverse application within your fleet, the many applications that you may have. Now, now driving this polyfueling thought is the fact that there are varied applications. So the fueling needs of a fleet is dependent upon transportation modes, route details, climate, and, and several other options. So there may be multiple needs across the fleet. Um, policy and incentives. You have global and state emission standards that are coming up. Um, you have increasing funding to favor deployment of alternative fuels, vehicles, and infrastructure, actually. Um, and, and technology side, you have greater adoption of alternative powertrains. You have efficiency gains in technology, both for both for the vehicle side as well as the infrastructure side. And there's really a, a better global supply chain of the options that are out there. Um, Sustainability-wise, you have millennials and Gen Z that have really been pushing hard for sustainability and corporations are following this and prioritizing sustainability along with the fact that on the investing side, you have ESG investing that has quadrupled in growth over the past years. You've seen investment houses like, like BlackRock that have come out and stated the importance of sustainability investing. So all this is pushing polyfuel. Now, as far as the agenda is concerned, um, I just talked about polyfueling. Uh, from here, let me dive in a little bit more on the company overview. And from there, Martin and I will cover polyfueling, the varying options there, and some of your next steps to stepping into that future. Now, our parent organization, US Venture, we are a family owned organization that specializes in transportation products. We're headquartered out of Wisconsin and we have a multitude of different divisions from distributing oil and gas in US oil to tires and aftermarket auto parts and auto force to lubricants. And we have an analytics and data play with breakthrough. The division that Martin and I are from is US Gain. And to speak a little bit more in US Gain, uh, we are a sustainable fueling solutions provider that really we're reducing emissions and doing that to get a cleaner world. Um, so we have representation, representation throughout the nation, in Canada as well, and we interact throughout the fueling value chain. So as you look to the map that's there in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, the items, the points that are in green are our RNG development sites, so where we're developing the fuel, where we have the supply for the fuel. We clean that up, we, we get it into the, uh, the pipeline, and we dispense that in, in varying different RNG delivery points that you see in the red dots there many of them in California, uh, but also throughout the nation. And we have uh, dispensing stations as well. We have public stations, mostly public stations that are in, in light yellow there. And we have stations in light blue that are private as well. And we have hybrids of both also. And I, you know, I talked about our specialization in transportation, but within gain, we step outside of that. So we believe in thermal energy supply. So non-transportation aspects, uh, one example, we're supplying the Seattle Tacoma Airport with all of its RNG needs to do heating throughout that airport. A uh, really cool opportunity. And then diving into the meat of things, getting away from the us 
and, and into some of the understanding around polyfueling and the infrastructure considerations, you know, selecting the right fuels here. So first and foremost, um, understand your, your current fleet or the fleets you serve. So what are the what are the duty cycles? What are the concurrent fueling needs and the dwell times? Uh, what are the route details such as mileage, the environmental factors, the, the return to base, dedicated routes, other items in that route detail thought? But then moving in and understanding how large a transition those fleets are planning or open to. Uh, so the financial and sustainability goals, um, which fuels are going to provide the, the, the best financial gain, which provide the best emissions reductions, what's the interplay of, of those as well? And, and then what regulations those fleets are marching up against? Um, so there's a lot of ZEV mandates that are coming up that have to be considered as well. Um, from there, uh, certainly marching into utility details, pricing, so the electric, uh, the pressure of the pipeline, natural gas, um, how much land availability do you have to get into new fuels, to expand upon the fuels that you have currently? And then as you think about things like, like, like hydrogen, uh, the water quality, the water pricing is going to come in big there. There's a lot of water that's required uh, if you're doing on-site production. Now, all, all of these items presented, uh, I tell you what, I'm going to pass on, and I, Martin, I have a question for you, and just to kind of, you know, ask and, and expand further upon this, if you could talk a bit, could you talk a bit to how a polyfueling provider would help to lead folks through some of these options, as well as going forward, how we would help support uh, station building? Yeah, I think, John, we're going to get through that with each of these um, fuels that we're going to be discussing, and that's that's with the RNG, the electric, um, and the hydrogen. So um, it's it's a diverse conversation that we should have throughout this presentation on that very topic of how we're going to move you forward with the various fuels and, and the right fuel for your future fleet. Um, let's say let's get into the, the RNG aspect of this right now. And I think we have a poll question for you, Edgar, if you can pose the poll question. So which methane feedstock has the lowest carbon intensity score? Please pick your favorite that you believe is the lowest. John, if you can get through to the next slide. I think I have to wait until the poll question is answered before okay. I can. Uh... There we go. All right. Do we have our final answer on the poll question? All right, looks like we have a fairly well-educated group here on CI score. So yes, Great. dairy and swine gas are gonna be your, your lowest. Um, ours typically ranges about a negative 150 CI score and lower for the dairy gas. Uh, your landfill gas is oftentimes gonna be in the mid 40s for us. Wastewater treatment gas will range a little bit higher typically for us. So great, thank you very much. So renewable natural gas, in our polyfuel world, renewable natural gas is our now and ready solution. The engine technology is tried and true. Um, distribution of RNG at CNG stations is available now, and it really is all with the lowest net neutral carbon emission footprint for vehicles. Um, so how are we producing our renewable natural gas? This happens through methane sequestration at landfills, uh, wastewater treatment plants, and dairies, all listed before in the poll. Um, all this methane is sourced from above ground. It's captured, cleaned, and ultimately injected back into the national pipeline grid. Uh, the traditional brown gas or fossil natural gas, which is captured from fracking, isn't necessary for renewable natural gas production. Uh, once captured, cleaned, and injected, RNG can then be dispensed at any compressed natural gas station that's part of the connected pipeline. And that really includes all private and public stations. Uh, the RNG can also be used for thermal applications, as John mentioned previously. One of our customers, SeaTac Airport, is a shining example of RNG used for purposes other than transportation, you know, in their boilers, for instance. Next slide. 
Now, some of the key benefits of renewable natural gas, um, or some of, the, of using renewable natural gas, are that it's clean, established, and affordable, and you can achieve immediate emission reductions for your fleet, and that's using low CI score gas from organic feedstocks, as previously mentioned. Uh, the availability of RNG supply is stable and is growing rapidly. Uh, we have an existing network of stations in place. There's proven and mature near zero engine technology. Um, I know we had a Cummins presentation a few weeks back uh, that did talk about that as well with the SAC Clean Cities Group. Uh, and then we have an emerging hybrid CNG EV technology, which is being developed. Um, Hylion is leading that space in heavy duty transportation applications. Uh, from an affordability standpoint, uh, we have the incentives through grant funding for infrastructure and vehicles, plus the Renewable Fuel Standard Federal Program and the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard credits, which helps lower the cost of fuel. Um, on the grant side, grants such as Carl Moyer can cover a large percentage of infrastructure investment, and those can often be stacked with other grant opportunities. Um, and then for any of, any of you, if there are any of you um, that operate up in Oregon, Oregon's adopted uh, the Clean Fuels Program, which closely mirrors California's LCFS program. So there's, again, more incentive on the fueling. So ideal applications. Um, first thing is I'm going to build on the term RNG and really reference it as RCNG, um, as this is a a renewable compressed natural gas when talking in terms of vehicle fuels. Um, transit, refuse, and school buses were some of the early adopters to RCNG. Um, waste management, for example, has grown to more than 6,500 collection trucks uh, with over 100 stations and still counting um, since adopting CNG in the 90s. Uh, the trucking industry is seeing an uptick in RCNG fleet expansion. For example, Anheuser-Busch recently announced that it's transitioning to, it's transitioning more than 180 trucks to uh, renewable natural gas and adding to the existing fleet of 160 uh, RCNG powered trucks. And it looks like they converted back in 2014 and 2015. Um, it's not necessarily early adoption, but it's a great step forward for that sector. Uh, and again, and building on that. These two examples, waste management and as a bush, they do have very different applications, which really shows you how diverse our CNG can be as a fuel. Um, the refuse industry is a re return to base user, which is optimal for time fill stations. And the trucking industry is more often based on a dedicated route, more likely to utilize a, a fast fill station. We're going to touch on those next. And then you, now RNG as a feedstock helps you bridge the gap from RCNG as a vehicle fuel to the future fuels we're discussing, such as hydrogen and battery electric charging. Uh, this is where the future fuels and future proofing your existing CNG station really comes into play, and that's how we're looking at it. Uh, you know, since 95% of all hydrogen is made from methane reform, there's opportunity to utilize your on-site RNG for your own on-site hydrogen production and dispensing. And, uh, this happens through SMR, which stands for steam methane reform. There are also options for using RNG to natural gas fuel cell, which produces electricity for on-site charging. John's going to touch on that later. Um, as well as RNG to hydrogen fuel cell, which can be used as uh, electric storage for EV charging. So, and again, these will both be covered later in the presentation. Um, before we move on to the other fuels, I'd like to spend just a few minutes looking at a time fuel station as compared to a fast fuel station, if you aren't a current station operator, um, you know, the question is which one of these options would fit your fleet the best. This slide shows you an example of a time fill station. Note the parking stalls with K-Rail barrier in the background um, and yellow dual hose fill posts located where a typical return to base fleet would normally park uh, at the end of a shift. Uh, in the time fill scenario, 
Vehicles will roll in, connect to the hose, and the fleet will fill together over an extended period of time. It can be hours, um, it could be you know, uh, overnight, whenever that fleet is idle at base. Uh, this is typically a least cost option as far as the station goes for your fleet. As there's no point of sale system needed, um, we have a simplified metering and dispensing process, and there's just less on-demand storage and compression needed. Uh, the time fill system is designed as really a behind the fence um, application with no public access, which is also a big differentiator. Um, now, the other station option for an RCNG station is a fast fill station. Note the canopy, the dispenser, and one of Anheuser Busch's Class A trucks performing a fast fill. Generally, these stations look and feel like a typical public access fueling station, a gas station, if you aren't familiar with these fast fill CNG stations. Uh, included in this is a point of sale system, um, which you don't have with time fill. It does have added storage and compression for on-demand fueling. Um, if you want public access, if you have a station and you want to sell to the public, this is how you would do that. Uh, this really lends itself well to fleets with dedicated routes that don't return to base daily necessarily. Um, as well as slip sleep operations and, and time critical carriers. Um, it's, it's important to analyze your fleet needs and really figure out which scenario works best for your application. You may find there's a need for a hybrid approach with a combination of time fill and fast fill. And then from a future proofing your investment standpoint, recognize that the fast fill fueling dispensing islands can be shared with multiple fuels, including hydrogen. Um, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna transition into the electric side right now, John. I'll go ahead and wait for those results. And as we can see those results, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what the options are here. Um, Edgar, excellent. So overall cost charging time uh, really like tying out here. So um, certainly uh, over, in terms of overall cost, it's something certainly that has to be considered as you're building on getting into a larger fleet. We'll cover that in some of the following slides. As far as charging time, we'll talk a little bit more about that and, and some of the ideal applications below here. Um, so going through this and getting into the benefits around electric, uh, certainly low low maintenance cost with these vehicles. There's less moving parts. There's going to be less to do on this. But additionally, you have a low fueling cost in general. This is a lot of the appeal behind this. Uh, but then in terms of being clean as a fuel, certainly zero tailpipe emission as a fuel um, has potential for being carbon neutral. And that's if you get into some of these renewables. So if you have the land space available, if you're willing to get into the upfront investment, uh, doing the on-site solar and wind, but additionally, you consider getting into uh, some of the solar and wind renewable energy credits that are available right now that you could purchase to get the carbon intensity of your, of your source electric down to a carbon intensity of zero. Um, so you could additionally, and this is an interesting option in getting into the thought of, of future proofing your, your, your investment. So if you have a current natural gas station, the sourcing of RNG that you may currently have, um, utilizing that RNG, you can get into utilizing uh, uh, natural gas fuel cells to produce both electricity and heat for the facilities that you have on site there, uh, but additionally can get into things like, like on-site generators for natural gas to produce electric. So there's ways that you can utilize your current natural gas supply to, uh, to provide electric for charging. Hey, John, uh, at, the, at the risk of sounding 
ignorant. Can you explain how a natural gas fuel cell works relative to EV charging? Um, I'm familiar with hydrogen fuel cells. It's a commonly used term, um, but less so about natural gas fuel cells. If you can just touch on that a little more. No, and that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, it, it's something that I think a lot of a lot of folks haven't been aware of. You know, natural gas fuel cells, they've been around since the 1800s when they were invented. I mean, so they've been around longer than hydrogen fuel cells. Um, hydrogen is, and it's a great thing that hydrogen has got a lot more uh, marketing recently, had a lot more exposure recently. The natural gas fuel cells, it's a proven technology. Um, going into the somewhat of how it works, it, uh, it, it takes that CH4, that methane molecule, and separates out some of the components there, uh, and utilizes some of the energy potential of having done that to produce electricity. And it does that through non-combustion means versus what a generator would do. That's also a higher efficiency than utilizing a generator on site as well. So it's a great way to make electricity. And if you think about this coming from renewable natural gas, something like dairy and the, the high negative carbon potential, carbon intensity, um, you're talking about a net negative carbon pathway. It's, it's, it's an interesting option to be considered. Um, now, ideal applications and, and to launch in more, um, uh, let me talk, you know, shorter routes, lighter duty cycles for, for electric charging. Uh, certainly, there's the limited capacity of those batteries that are on board the vehicles. But then uh, return to base applications is ideal. You, you don't have a lot of in-route charging that's happening right now. And so the return to base is, is, is good, you know, won't involve, you, you don't have to have drivers that are stopping along the way and doing, uh, spending their time to charge the vehicles. Um, now high dwell time, certainly the availability to charge those up to full and fair weather climates will speak to you here. Um, you have examples like uh, what the Port Authority out in New Jersey is doing right now um, to where they experience some cold climates. And they've seen that uh, the, the battery, uh, the, um, the mileage potential for those vehicles can go down to less than half when you have a cold day. So it's something that really needs to be considered. Uh, fair weather climate is best for these vehicles. So now the, the technology readiness, uh, you know, these city transit as well as, as light duty is, is furthest along here in terms of commercial availability, but the school buses are following closely behind. And as you get into the limited commercial availability in the middle of the slide, um, there's a lot of modes that, that are coming along well. Um, that said, it, the advancement, um, and there's a lot of advancement in these that's being accelerated by some of the polyfueling drivers that I mentioned earlier. So the available incentives, technology readiness that's coming along, and, the, and really the overall interest in sustainability. Um, we'll likely see these move faster as well due to some of the ZEV mandates that have come along especially in the state of California, but, but certainly outside of there as well. And then I'm gonna jump in a little bit more on the electrical uh, infrastructure considerations. And in talking through there, let me start out by saying, um, you know, specific to electric charging, we interact with customers on, on a high level and getting the understandings of uh, some of the, um, some of the understanding and the benefits specific to the fleet, but then diving further in from there, we tend to work with expert industry partner organizations to dig further into the details on charging infrastructure and, and to ensure making any transition into electrical charging really a, a seamless one. Um, and in working with these organizations, GAIN can, can manage this electric charging infrastructure as part of the overall polyfueling station, um, along with the ongoing support that we can provide uh, and an optimal solution for your entire fleet. For all of this, you know, the fuels that you may be running. Um, now, uh, jumping into the fleet details here, uh, let me talk a little bit more to the, the, the thought of mid or small sized fleets. And as your fleet expands, um, it, it can be important to take this in and note that when larger fleets are considered, the cost of adding infrastructure to handle the load profile, the, the power that's required for that fleet can become prohibitively expensive. Uh, so where fleet size, where that's becoming too large, uh, where that point occurs, it's really dependent upon the individual fleet, the individual application, and, and we encourage talking to uh, experts uh, that have background in this to, to understand more about where that might be the case with, with your fleet. Um, now, in our details, I explained a little bit earlier, I'm not going to cover that again, what's in parentheses there. 
but I'm going to jump in on charging in infrastructure and charging equipment um, and say that, you know, really you can see the charger types level one. I probably shouldn't have here. It's, it, you know, it's really just for residential, but as you get in um, the level two charging, getting into 240 volts, it's the most common commercial and public charging level that, that's out there. It's also going to be your lowest cost option. It's like a closed dryer in terms of the, the voltage there. Um, level three, um, as you need a faster charge, having DC fast chargers is the fastest option, and, and it runs typically between 200 and 600 volts. Um, but it, it's also really expensive, and it's, it's going to require a significant amount of electrical infrastructure upgrades to be able to accommodate this. Um, and now, with the different modes of transportation, the interfaces that you can come upon, uh, wireless uh, interface, uh, so wireless charging, as well as overhead charging that you might encounter with, uh, for example, buses to where you'd have a pantograph up or a pantograph down charger. Uh, most common you're going to see is going to be plug-in charging. And, and then you have multiple different connector types that have to be accommodated and thought of here. So uh, from level two charging that you're going to see port J1772 um, to getting into uh, some of the common interfaces, um, apologies, as you get into some of the um, um, some of the common interfaces with level three charging, um, that uh, it's going to be getting into Chad Emo charging um, interfaces. You, you get into connectors that are CCS connectors. You have specific Tesla connectors as well as you have that technology in your fleet. Um, but all this said, what I'll say is that we appreciate working with some of our industry experts to really keep uh, keep touch of this. Um, now, moving to, down into charge control, and, and with all the draw of having a fleet that's doing electric charging, um, as we're talking about drawing off the grid, it, it means that charging at the right time, um, doing at the right rate, is going to be an incredible factor in terms of controlling your utility rate. Uh, so, so really, the, the charge control, the smart charging that you can incorporate across your, your infrastructure, it, it can mean up to a 40% or more decrease in your utility cost and your electric cost. So it's an important thing to keep into account. Um, and that said, uh, I'm going to pass along and, and Martin, I think I, I'd be interested to hear some of your comments along some of the space availability uh, constraints and some of the utility requirements that have to be taken into account. Yeah, John, from uh, the space availability and utility requirement standpoints relative to infrastructure considerations, uh, it's pretty well known that the most important aspects of adopting the EV charging in, in this, in the polyfuel station concept is really to understand your growth plans, uh, understand your space constraints, and get started working with your utility from the get-go. Um, have a good idea of what your fleet size will be and what your charging requirements will be in the future. Determine how much space is needed for depot charging. Determine if you want to incorporate opportunity charging for other fleets and the public. And of course, we need to consider utility grid and transformer capacity. Um, this can be a huge barrier. Make sure there's a clear understanding of your current power needs uh, with an eye on future needs so the utility can plan accordingly. Um, another consideration, does your site have any solar or wind capabilities which can help generate electricity. Um, also, if you're using any kind of fuel cell to generate electricity, as was previously mentioned by John, whether that's using SMR or electrolysis generated hydrogen or RNG to fuel cell, the gas, water, and electric utility capabilities need to be sized properly um, and with confirmed availability. So that, that takes care of the high level infrastructure considerations that we're always looking at with these polyfuel stations. Now, with, with this graphic, I wanted to really stress, uh, you know, how this graphic is, is emphasizing our belief in polyfueling future to start with. Um, so a, a, as a ZEV fleet is, is, is growing, you know, the, the per vehicle infrastructure cost for, for battery electric is, is, is going to be lower. So I'll note the line here in, in gold. Um, and at a certain point, though, um, many of you may have seen this uh, this graphic in other um, other avenues. 
uh, but it's going to intersect at, at a point. And the point at which this intersects, it's, it's really going to be dependent, dependent upon each application and upon each fleet. But afterwards, you'll see that you know, the per vehicle infrastructure cost is going to become lower for fuel cell electric vehicles as, as opposed to battery electric. Um, so you see the blue kind of comes down to the lower piece here. But of course, uh, I'll note as well that this graphic is, is not taking into account some of the environmental factors, the climate constraints, the range that, that may factor into whether a fleet would invest in one of the other of these technologies or, or both. With that, another polling question here. If you guys interact, we'd love to see your, uh, your, your thoughts. Excellent. So overall cost is something that's coming into play, and, I, and I'll agree that uh, the fuel cell electric is going to have a much larger upfront cost. It's going to have some larger fueling costs as well, and, and I tell you, it's exciting. It, it, keep keep online, guys, because we're, we're going to get into this in, in a little bit more detail at playing out just one example of, of, of for example, battery electric versus uh, fuel cell electric. Um, so um, it, it's good to note the interest and the, and the concern, the consideration around that piece. Um, so uh, talking more to the benefits here, uh, in terms of ease of use, this is going to have longer range than electric. Uh, you know, you're going to, and maybe a smaller note, avoid overburdening some of the electric grid. Uh, so a smaller note is as U.S. fleet owners or infrastructure owners might be concerned. But uh, additionally, I'll note the faster fueling time, the diesel-like fueling time that you can have with hydrogen. Um, that's clean as, as a fuel. So again, a zero tailpipe fuel. So uh, this is, you know, it can be better than carbon neutral. Uh, the potential for net negative is you consider that you might have renewable natural gas coming into your site already. Uh, the thought of using a methane reformer starting from a, a highly negative carbon intensity dairy gas, um, even doing the full conversion, getting over into hydrogen generation on site from that dairy gas you can have a highly net negative hydrogen that, that's put out um, and some good credit value behind that as well as certainly some sustainability factors that come into play. Um, now, as far as being net neutral, green hydrogen is a thought to be considered here as well and, and it's certainly not to be discounted. Um, so it's the thought if you have the land availability to getting into having on-site solar or wind uh, to be able to have renewables fueling electric that would then cleave your your, your your water water into the individual hydrogen and the oxygen to produce you know, hydrogen molecule, hydrogen gas. Um, additionally, you could actually source uh, renewable energy credits to be able to get down to, uh, you know, zero carbon intensity and do green hydrogen in, in this way, uh, feeling that electrolyzer to, uh, to clean water. Now, ideal applications, um, if you have uh, larger ZEV fleets, if you have uh, heavy duty cycles, it can give me ideal applications for this. So I talked about some of the lower infrastructure costs that comes into play there, uh, faster fueling as you have some of the heavy duty cycles. And this is going to factor in this, uh, to some of the slip seat applications and how that's going to get a factor into this. Um, any climate. So as you compare this against battery electric, it's, it's important to note that, um, you know, the battery capacity isn't going to suffer that, that same degradation and in colder climates here. Uh, so you have the hydrogen that's, that's fueling the, uh, the momentum here. Um, now, redu return to base as well as dedicated routes can be handled. I will give the sub note on dedicated routes that um, this is going to be fairly specific to California. We're going to have more infrastructure available to do the fueling along those routes. Um, and it can be shorter or long routes too. Now, uh, getting an infrastructure considerations, diving deeper in, and I'm not going to cover these fleet details. Again, I, I just kind of covered this in the last slide. So I'll jump to fueling equipment and some of the fueling types that you encounter here. So H70, H35, and to translate into what that means. 
um, H70 for 70 megapascals and 30, H35 for 35 megapascals. Um, converting over to PSI, maybe it's a more familiar term here for fleets. Um, H70 relates to 10,000 PSI approximately. H35 relates to um, 5,000 PSI approximately. And as you're talking about the vehicles that would need these two different um, you know, fueling pressures, so for the most part, uh, the residential and the passenger light duty vehicles are going to be coming in and fueling at H70. Some older ones are going to be more at the, um, the 5,000 PSI. Um, and then as you get into heavy duty, certainly some of the more heavy, some of the some of the prototypes, some of the demos mm -hmm. that are being looked at right now are getting into that 10,000 PSI pressure range. But a, a lot of them, uh, the buses that are in production right now from New Flyer are, are 5,000 PSI range. Um, so heavy duty is, is mostly going to be in that range. Um, so storage and compression, you can realize uh, the, the, the storage piece very similar to what you do with, with CNG to where you'd have a high, a mid, and a low bank of, of pressure storage um, to be able to accommodate that, that 10,000 PSI. Uh, you know, so you maybe had a high at a 12,500 and then the mid and the low to be able to come you know, downwards of that. But one of the things that we're advocating for is you can store this with hydrogen at, at, at a single pressure, getting into 6,500 PSI. And then as you have a 10,000 PSI need, um, your, your dispenser, your, your compressors, you're going to have a ramp up on demand with the station modules uh, to get to that 10,000 as needed. Or you can just ramp down from that 6,500 to the 5,000 PSI fueling. Um, now, jumping into the, the refueling rate piece of this. So you have a maximum rate of 3.6 kilograms per minute for the vehicles. So uh, just to play that out, what you're talking about is for the larger 60 kilogram storage vehicles that are that are in production right now, um, you're talking about upwards of, of 15 minutes to be able to do a full fueling. So um, Martin, again, I'm gonna pass along to you. I'm curious if you can speak a little bit more to some of the space availability and some of the utility requirements uh, behind hydrogen, digging deeper in. Yeah, so John, the, with hydrogen, we look at a combination of considerations and that really takes from both the uh, RCNG station infrastructure and the EV charging infrastructure considerations. Um, you know, some of the main ones. Do you want a publicly accessible fueling station? Uh, if so, the station will need to be in an area where public vehicles aren't infringing on your operations, whether that's in a corporate yard or in a secured area, for instance. Um, then what hydrogen source really fits um, your space requirements and financial models? As this does directly impact the station equipment footprint and it's, it's a huge consideration. For instance, if you have a delivered gaseous hydrogen station, um, that footprint can be as small as 22 foot by 55 foot uh, and really provide you dispensing capabilities, you know, 600, 800 kilograms daily. Again, that's delivered gaseous hydrogen, no, no uh, production on site. Um, a larger SMR station footprint may take up as much as 55 foot by 80 foot, and this is while providing a bit more than 800 kilograms of hydrogen uh, dispensing daily capability. Um, liquid hydrogen, delivered liquid hydrogen is a whole different animal where space considerations are much more impacted by bulk liquid storage tanks and required offset distances from electrical components, building openings, property lines. Um, and in all, in all cases though, what's important is the hydrogen dispensing can be on the shared fuel island. Um, it, it doesn't matter which one of these. So uh, as far as liquid SMR on-site production or gaseous delivery. And relative to the utilities, uh, whether gas, electric, or water, again, we already talked about this, just plan and coordinate well ahead of time. Size your services to accommodate all of your future fuel needs. Um, one of the key differences with hydrogen from SMR, you know, versus hydrogen from electrolysis or from delivered gas, or even uh, from a traditional CNG station for that matter, really is the need for a lot of water and coordination from the local water service provider is important. Um, I think we're gonna move on to a couple other things here, John, if you can move on to the next slide. Certainly. 
we're going to look um, at and, the, and let's get uh, sorry go ahead go ahead Mark. Uh, so, uh, you know, as we look into the different station types that, that we're considering here, so, uh, you know, Martin mentioned, mentioned the, the thought process of delivered hydrogen versus onset generation. And um, let me march over to the, uh, the graphics just to jump into uh, some of the visuals on this. Um, so on the bottom right here, and, you know, this is a polyfueling station where we're playing out natural gas along with hydrogen fueling availability. And, and additionally, we, we'd be considering, we will be considering uh, electric charging on this site as well. But um, uh, the gray box, as opposed to the yellow box here, is the difference between delivered hydrogen versus having on-site generation. Um, and now carrying up into the zoomed in view, the dark black here is, is showing the land grab. Martin went over some of those uh, specifics on, on what the area was. Uh, but you can see how this is fairly smaller than having in yellow the, the on-site generation uh, available. And, and a lot of that is due to there's some additional space constraints that have to be taken up when you're, you're considering um, doing uh, methane reformers, uh, the large rectangular spaces here, or if you have electrolyzers that are on-site as well, this is you know, the other option of generating things. Um, now the the individual points here. Uh, I'll note that uh, you know with delivered hydrogen uh, advantages, uh, Martin talked about some of the differences in space between liquid versus gaseous. I'm not going to cover that again, but um, you know for for the cost for the uh, for the equipment cost, you're talking about 50% less as you don't have those the equipment that's related to the on-site generation. Um, it, you're going to be avoiding some of that equipment cost, but additionally, you, you avoid some of the, the power outage issues with delivered hydrogen um, in, in that you have it coming from multiple different sources. So, so that's a nice safe factor. Um, now, lower utility consumption, certainly if you're not doing the onsite production, but, and I'm going to hit on this a little bit more, less credit potential. So the current suppliers uh, don't get down into the extreme negatives of, of carbon intensity right now. And that's you may see that somewhat in the future, but for right now, the, the negative 200s and negative 300s um, from the from what you get from RNG, um, you're not going to see what that converts to on the hydrogen side. You're not going to see that um, from suppliers for delivered hydrogen. Um, now, on-site generation, uh, electrolysis, the cleaving of the, the water molecule that I mentioned versus now digging deeper in on the uh, the, the methane reform, you're cleaving apart the, the carbon um, from the hydrogen there. So the CH4, um, the hydrogen comes off, you get four water pieces, but then you have carbon that will then combine with oxygen too. You do have some emissions for carbon dioxide that comes off of these, um, but it's not a ton. Um, it does as well with methane reform as I thought, it does future proof an existing natural gas supply. So you can utilize that on site to produce and produce hydrogen. Um, and with a good CI score and for some good um, uh, you know, credit value. Uh, more, there's more expense involved with this. I talked about the added expense and the delivered hydrogen piece. Um, higher utility consumption as we uh, as we start looking at those methane reformers require a good amount of, of utilities, um, but there's larger credit potential as you get into those net negatives. And Martin, uh, I'm curious if you can add some of the additional design considerations to be considered on this. Yeah, a couple simple considerations um, we looked at when we were proposing this station layout really was location of the shared gas and electric utilities so that if the RCG station is built first, we'll have plenty of clear space for the hydrogen station, no matter which option of hydrogen source we go with. Um, so that's one important consideration. We incorporated joint trenches to the dispensing island um, using sleeves as placeholders for the high pressure tubing, which then can be installed at a later date, assuming that the CNG station is built first, hydrogen station is built later. Um, you know, this goes for the future electrical as well between the station equipment and dispensers. Get the conduit installed, conduit installed now and save time and money on infrastructure build out uh, when you're ready to build in that next phase, that next station. Um, you'll also notice the call out for the renewable diesel tank. Well, you may not have noticed it since it's so small on the slide. Uh, and I don't, my, my mouse doesn't actually work on your, your little 
presentation there, John, but um, this location was taken <laughs> into consideration uh, you know, as well as the path of travel for any piping required to get to the fueling island. So just looking at how we can kind of maximize and, and, and get the best efficiencies when looking at our first phase of the station, which is the CNG. So vehicle ready, right you've seen this slide in the electric piece, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go quick here to make sure we have some time for questions. But um, you know, transit and light duty, you see again out in front, but you may see the advancement of these other modes moving uh, a lot faster. We expect an acceleration of this due to some of the ZEV mandates, due to some of the polyfueling drivers that, that I mentioned previously. There's also a great growth in, in the demand um, that's expected around hydrogen. And skipping into this, and a lot of you mentioned the, the the infrastructure cost behind hydrogen, and this is this is really the money slide behind covering that that, that topic, that thought process. Uh, wanted to put this up. It's a um, and it's closing on some of these zero tailpipe fuels here. Um, so it, it's going over, you know, really one example of where fuel cell vehicles were implemented, and an economic comparison to battery electric. Uh, so that said, I'm gonna at the subnote of this is a single use case. Um, it's not the standard that sets an exact fleet number for everyone. Um, that kind of conversation has to happen again with, with folks that have expertise around this. Um, but it's how the work, uh, the numbers worked out for, in this case is foothill transit. Um, so this, it, what it does is it provides excellent insight and insight into the type of costs to be considered when you're looking at the varying different zero tailpipe fuels, one versus another. Now, marching through, uh, you know, the capital costs, fuel cell electric buses, to the point that was brought up earlier, certainly you've got a lot more upfront cost on this uh, versus the battery electric option. And that's gonna be the case with any mode. Uh, there's there's more parts of it that, that are involved here. There, there's more rare earth metals that go into a fuel cell bus. Um, there's higher fuel cost that's going to be involved. There's going to be higher maintenance cost. Battery electric is going to have less moving parts than fuel cell will. But it's when you get into the midlife replacement that things start to change around here. So as, as you look at battery electric versus fuel cell, um, there's a lot more batteries in being incorporated into that battery electric uh, vehicle. And, and so that the replacement of that is going to be significantly higher than what you'll have with fuel cell. Um, also on the infrastructure side, and this is again a larger fleet. Um, and this cost here is getting into just delivered hydrogen. Um, so you see a number of, of 4 million to be able to accommodate up to 30 vehicles, uh, 30 buses in this case, versus, uh, you know, charges would have, would have cost uh, up to 11 million, specific to Foothill Transit's example. And now jumping into, they're summarizing and adding up all of these values and what, what Foothill size is a, a difference of, of 13 million in going with fuel cell buses fuel cell vehicles as opposed to the battery electric vehicles. I'll also note specifically, and some of you are saying, well, there's a lot more battery electric vehicles being compared here against the fuel cell vehicles. But in their instance, heavy duty cycles, a lot of changeover of drivers, you had longer routes. And so they were able to incorporate less fuel cell buses because of the fast fueling time, because of the longer range, as opposed to the larger amount of battery electric buses they would have had to go with here. Um, so those were the items that came into play. Now, let me pass along to Martin to jump in further on some of the other biofuels we have and to close us out. Yeah, thanks, John. We'll touch on this just very quickly as our time is definitely running low here. Um, and while our company sees renewable natural gas, um, our CNG, electric and hydrogen as the three primary players in the renewable fuel space, we can really facilitate bringing a multitude of renewable fuels to a polyfuel station in an effort to aid fleets in, in their decarbonizing, uh, decarbonization strategy. And whether that's with ethanol, renewable diesel, biodiesel, and even renewable propane. Um, John, if you can, there. Uh, and, and then in conclusion, um, we have a polypool strategy that requires a strong understanding of your future fueling needs with plenty of advanced planning. Um, and the beauty is that this can be built all upon your existing infrastructure for those of you that have existing infrastructure. 
Um, strong partnerships can help simplify the process in securing grant funding for infrastructure or vehicles, uh, and also monetizing clean fuel credits, uh, as well as designing and building these facilities. So that's what strong partnerships can provide. And U.S. Game really is looking forward to being a partner with you guys. Um, I would like to invite you to check out our blog, which is at the bottom of the, this slide. Um, it's usgain.com forward slash blog to learn more about our company uh, and developments in the alt field space. Um, Sean and my contact information is included here. Uh, we both look forward to, to hearing from you all and, and digging in deeper uh, offline from this presentation uh, as you all see fit. So, John, I know we're, we're wrapping up this part of the presentation. What I did want to get into, though, and I think it's a very important part of the conversation, is I'm hoping you can speak a bit about uh, how credit value is impacted in using your RNG for generation of zero tailpipe emission fuels such as hydrogen and electric. I think that's a very important topic to build upon. Yeah, that's, it's a really important note. You know, there's so many details involved here. It's a lot of conversations with carbon. It's, it's really a lot that goes into coming up with what, what a pathway is going to look like. Uh, and geez, there's so many different options for, for what can happen here. So, um, you know, at the high level, let me, let me note in, in just answering that, we've seen examples from, from some of uh, some of the other consulting organizations that are out there that, that really concentrate only on generating um, and, and trading in credits. Uh, you know, there's been, and I, I like to cover this, there's been a tale, there's been, there's been the comment to folks that um, you can get up to $12 a kilogram re returned um, for some of the hydrogen fueling that's out there. Here's the problem with that comment. And here's the issue with that comment is it, it isn't in taking into account any of the cost behind this. The RNG, you know, the project side that goes into this, the transportation, uh, even outside of, of those is, is getting into, um, you know, the costs that are incurred and, and working with the utility for using the pipeline. That's what's involved there. Um, so those things need to be taken into account. And, and most importantly as well is it's, it's not taking into account that there's, there's a fuel pathway behind this. So it's, it's not that you're just taking negative 300 uh, RNG gas and yet you convert over and you now switch to the energy efficiency rating for, for hydrogen, which can multiply it by 3.5 for, for light duty. So um, there's efficiency losses, of course, in all of that. So uh, when, when you're talking about doing that and some of the losses that you occur for uh, some of the emissions from a methane reformer on site, or even if you're um, uh, you know, varying other different ways that this can be done, those need to be taken into account. And, and some of the, um, you know, if this thing isn't operating all the time, the cell reformer isn't operating all the time. So you can figure on, and this is, I'm just throwing out a number, between a 75 and 100 point loss in, in your, your grams of carbon dioxide per megajoule. So that, that's being added on top of that negative 300. So now you're at a, at a very different number um, through going through that SMR process. But this has to be considered. Uh, so your value is going down now. Um, now, all that said, uh, you certainly still result in a net negative on this, and, and you certainly still revolve, uh, and you still you certainly still result in a good credit value. And uh, additionally, I'd say that um, you know you need to be able to you may be able to take into advantage some of the capacity for dispensing as you start talking about hydrogen and as you start talking about electric as well. Um, there's options within the LCFS program to be able to pay out for the capacity of the station, not just what you're dispensing, not just what you're charging. Um, now, this is exclusively for light duty side of things right now. There's some other factors that are involved on the electric piece. Talk to some experts in this area. I reach with someone like ourselves, uh, and let's chat more about this. Um, and, and this program is being considered to move into the heavy duty space as well. So I will make that note also. Um, John, so, you're a wealth yeah. of information on this stuff. So I, I would encourage anyone that's interested in learning more about that very topic to, to reach out to John directly or myself for that matter. And I'll, I can help facilitate that conversation, but uh, you've done a lot of research in that space. So it's appreciated. I would, I would also like to understand if you have a good idea about um, the trends for funding in the hydrogen and electric space, um, 
Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, no, certainly that's a big topic around this. So uh, and I know infrastructure costs came up as, as a major concern. Um, according to the data, and, and we work with uh, an organization, GNA, um, and looking over some of these funding availabilities. And, and what we've seen there is there's been a, a large increase in the amount of funding that's, that's available, uh, especially in the, the zero tailpipe fueling. So as we track this, this has been increasing. Um, and this is what we tracked actually both on, on the vehicle and the infrastructure side. Um, so in paying for that upfront infrastructure, you have grants that are out there like, like Carl Moyer uh, that's being offered by, by CARB that, that can be for up to 60%, um, well, 60% sometimes more of your, your station build. Um, so you have funding from individual AQMDs, and I'll give a nice uh, sort of feather in the cap to SAC AQMD here that, that have offered up funding at, at times to be able to accommodate some of this zero tailpipe fueling um, and building on infrastructure on that side. But, uh, um, but additionally, you have DOE funding that can be available as you talk about things like polyfueling and, and what a model for that might look like and building that out. You have funding from the California Energy Commission that, that has come out. Um, and there's multiple others there. So uh, connect into folks, um, talk a little bit more about this, get an understanding around it, help to pay for that upfront infrastructure cost. Uh, there's a lot available to help. Um, but yep. additionally, as your, as your station would get up and running, you have the LCFS program that would, you know, I've talked to some of this, but there's, there's credits that can be generated for the fueling that you're dispensing, as well as the, you know, the potential for dispensing that fuel. So I'm going to jump in right now and say we're at time, and I wanted to just do a couple of things. First of all, I want to thank you guys and say to anybody who's online right now who has to get off, thank you very, very much for joining us. I'm going to do a little bit of a end of presentation summary, and then if John and Martin are willing, we will continue to work through any questions that have come up uh, pretty much till we ask sure. them. But for those people that need to jump off right now, let me just do a very quick, um, a very quick sort of uh, final uh, thank you to folks with a with a little bit of a rundown on uh, on this. Um, I wanted to, to to say thank you very much to our Sacramento Clean City sponsors, uh, and we you know we wouldn't be able to do anything without the work the help that they provide us to let everybody know that we, we have an upcoming, our, our upcoming series, tech and spec series. We have the next, in two weeks, we have the uh, renewable propane and near zero emission engines. I think Edgar is gonna put a link to this webinar in the chat uh, function if you'd like to check it out. And then once again, these are our speakers, John Somerset, Martin Mills. We thank them very much for joining us. So having said that, <clears throat> I just wanted to kind of do a formal conclusion. And then for anybody who'd like to have questions answered, uh, Edgar, are you gonna be able to sort of work your way through the question and answer process or uh, how's that gonna work? All the questions um, that were submitted, either via chat or Q&A um, are now on the Q&A itself. Um, so John and Martin, if you guys are able to view those, um, and want to answer those live, that would be great. Just starting from the top with Bill West, Westerfield's question. Yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> from Dwight, I'm looking at this, um, you know, in terms of handling, um, <clears throat> um, actually, sorry, Bill, Bill Westerfield. So starting at the top here, <clears throat> on-site uh, renewable natural gas to a natural gas fuel cell, would this have carbon emissions? It, it, what it's, it's not occurring through combustion. So you, you don't have the same carbon emissions that you'd have, for example, uh, for example, from a, um, uh, having an onsite uh, generator. So that, that's the piece that I'd, that I'd note in there. Um, it, it's also gonna have a higher efficiency in terms of the, uh, the electric that you're, that you're producing from this. Um, so uh, it, that's something that's, that's really nice to have as well. So I was carb issued a, a CI for this fueling pathway. There's some established uh, pathways that are utilizing this as, as part of their overall thought. Uh, so AC Transit right now is, is utilizing, um, so they, they, they utilize natural gas. Um, they use a, um, a natural gas fuel cell to produce electric. 
and then they use the um, the electric to uh, uh, to fuel an electrolyzer, and uh, and that electrolyzer then makes makes hydrogen. So it, it, it's an interesting. It's um, uh, it's, it's a pretty complex pathway, I would say, in that sense, but um, but it works for them, and they've got some great upfront funding in terms of the uh, the, the fuel cell that they they brought on. Um, and so it's worked out well for them. So these are where I, I mentioned that, uh, you know, really a lot of this around is around just having the, um, uh, the conversations and digging a little bit further in with, with, with experts in these spaces um, and the multiple fields that you're considering um, to be able to get to the right endpoint for your fleet. Hey, John, I'm going to, I think I can, uh, I'm not sure if Dwight <laughs> is still on. I did see that Dwight commented, um, he, at the end of the presentation, he might have had to jump off. But Dwight, you have a lot of questions, which are all really good questions. Um, I'm going to take a couple of these high-level ones, and I think what we can do is reach out to you more directly. Um, and so, oh, Dwight's still here. Perfect. Clear. Either way, we, yeah, we we have a lot of or, a lot of questions and not much time left. So, um, just high level. Yes, we are partnering. We're, we're looking for additional partners, but we're currently working with someone on the charge management. Um, and this is for a station application um, that we have out for grants right now. Um, so you're, the answer is, are we partnering? Yes. Um, have we implemented electric charging with any fleets from the U.S. gain side in a polyfuel station? We've got design out on multiple of them and we're working on the implementation of those uh, as we speak. Um, John, I'm not sure if you have a case study with cost data and underpinning the graph comparing the infrastructure costs of hydrogen versus electricity. Um, I, I will go to the next question quickly. Before I, went, I went I went over that. some of the results. That, that, that was exactly a case study of, uh, of what was presented for Foothill Transit. Um, so there, there is a study behind that um, that's much more detailed. It'd be, it'd be great to chat, you know, offline with Dwight, uh, connect in and talk more. Yeah, and then Dwight, you also asked, do we have a layout that includes uh, electricity like we do for the CNG and hydrogen? Um, the answer is in this polyfuel station that we're building out right now. Um, again, we're actually commissioning the CNG station, I think, next week as recent as, as soon as that um, that has hydrogen station design incorporated and it also has the electric charging station uh, component designed into it so the answer is yes we do have a layout the layout that you saw in the presentation um, is another option that we have presented to a customer um, that incorporate the, the drawing itself that you saw incorporated the cng uh, RCNG and hydrogen components, but then behind the fence, um, I believe it's to the west on the drawing, is uh, where there's going to be charging capabilities as well. So that is incorporated. This, so, you know, Martin, really I think another interesting, Martin, I think another let interesting. Let me just say uh, one thing, John. John, let me just say one thing, ahead. and that is if, if, if a convert, if a specific conversation relative to some very detailed questions like the ones Dwight is asking is, is something that folks want to have, we could have a much smaller, just sort of Q and A that we would facilitate. If, if that's a, a something that we want, uh, there may be a desire to have a private one in which case clean cities wouldn't be involved, but we would love to be able to facilitate something very specific. If that happens, uh, excuse me for interrupting. I'll no, that's fantastic. Thank you, Tim. And uh, yes, by all means, um, you know, smaller conversation, uh, getting into some of these detailed topics where we're more than happy to entertain that. Um, and if site clean cities would, 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 would facilitate that, uh, I mean, that, that's fantastic. Um, either way, whatever works out best for folks. Um, so, uh, Martin, I did have kind of a quick question for you, if you could talk a little bit more from the uh, business development side. Uh, so some of the uh, geographic limitations uh, behind renewable fuels, um, you know, I, I think it'd be interesting for the audience to hear a little bit more around whether you can, get, can you get all of these fuels everywhere? I mean, is that the case? Or, and are they financially viable everywhere? Um, so if you could just kind of gapping off here, if you could provide some additional comments on that side. Yeah, there's there's some limitations um, that you're going to find with with renewable natural gas stations. 
obviously if there is not a, a, a utility provider um, that's bringing natural gas to you via the pipeline, you're going to have constraints. There, uh, there are plenty of cases where, where there's an on-site production itself of renewable natural gas where you can then actually, instead of using pipeline gas, um, you can produce and dispense on site. Uh, there are limitations to that. Um, you have EV infrastructure issues in many places. Um, so there's limitations there on how big of a charging infrastructure you can provide. But places that have delivered fuels, delivered renewable fuels, there really shouldn't be any reason why you have limitations. And, and for instance, um, renewable propane. And Tim, I think you're going to have another uh, webinar on that fuel. Renewable diesel. Those are some options that you can really look at if, if there are limitations and restrictions based on your geography. But other than that, there really shouldn't be much. Um, I think we're getting up against our time that we have uh, allowed for ourselves. So uh, I would like to say, first of all, John, thank you very much for all your, your, your knowledge in this space. Um, clean cities, fat clean cities, thank you very much for, for providing this platform. Um, Edgar, thank you for walking us through this process and getting it started for us and, and helping moderate. So uh, it's much appreciated. And I, I encourage Dwight, I would like to continue the conversations as Tim mentioned. Um, I think Nico, you had another much more detailed question on there as well. Uh, please reach out and let's find some time to continue those conversations and really talk about the future fueling and polyfueling environments for us.